Jerry Douglas is justly celebrated as the director of The Back Row, one of the first hardcore films made after Stonewall. The Back Row is a precious artifact, showing a pre disney fied Times Square and the seedy, gritty, 70s New York City that is a legend to many people who remember it. But The Back Row also documented a fixture in the culture of gay cruising, the movie theater. On this episode, we're going to celebrate The Back Row, an explicit and somewhat loose version of Midnight Cowboy that earns its place in gay porn history. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to once again remind you to help this channel if you haven't already by clicking the subscribe button and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. Jerry Douglas was no stranger to directing plays that involved nudity. While Douglas put himself through school at Yale directing community theater productions, he met a woman whose husband, Sam, would eventually become his partner on his subsequent films. In an interview, Douglas said he was approached by Sam with the idea of making an erotic film. Douglas agreed, but only if it was a gay movie. Sam agreed, and he and Douglas set off to make their first gay erotic film together. Although Douglas did not have experience in filmmaking, it was through this production he discovered he was quite good at it. In order to understand why the back row was culturally significant, it's important we talk about the role of the movie theater in gay culture during the late 60s and early 70s. The 1970s saw the proliferation of theaters in major urban centers specializing in the exhibition of gay pornography. They quickly became popular by both seismic shifts in LGBT visibility in the wake of the 1969 Stonewall riots, and larger trends in industry, law, and culture that increasingly brought pornography of all stripes into the mainstream. The theaters, many of them relics of Hollywood's yesteryear playing art house cinema, had a new life and provided a public venue for audiences of primarily gay men to view gay pornography as well as have various erotic and social encounters with one another. The theaters brought possibilities for sexual exploration and subcultural community building. But the theaters also brought economic opportunities to their owners and managers, for whom the exhibition of gay porn offered a means to specialize within an ever more crowded market for pornography of all kinds. Coming to be known as a cruising place for gay men, it was only natural that a film about cruising in a theater something not seen before on screen by audiences who were aware of the activities and usually participated, created a film with cultural zeitgeist. And we owe it all to a developing industry, shifting cultural landscapes and movements, and laws that were challenged and re-examined. Gay porn theaters in the 1970s not only provide a richer account of a key period in the histories of both American pornography, but also opens up new questions regarding the role of the gay porn theater in everyday practices of 1970s era gay men. The gay porn theater will be a topic of conversation that we'll revisit in a future episode. The back row begins with images of signs promoting sex bars, movie theaters, and bookstores. Then we close up on Casey Donovan's ass. Donovan plays the lead in the back row as a streetwise New Yorker. The director credit in the title card reads Doug Richards, whom we now know was really Jerry Douglas. Almost immediately, Douglas' style can be seen by his opening shots of Donovan lighting a cigarette from behind while a sailor walks into the movie theater. One thing that should be noted is how personal the score is to the film itself. Minimal and brooding, it lends to the visuals so well. The music continues to captivate you as the sailor befriends a stranger in dark glasses, sniffing what I can only assume are poppers. After the sailor and the stranger with glasses are done, Donovan exits the theater and walks the streets of 1970s New York. At the Port Authority bus terminal, Donovan spots George Payne, who is credited as the kid from Montana, dressed as a cowboy. This is Payne's first appearance in a gay porn film. The music in the background again adds to the scene, almost narrating the scene, something I'm sure Douglas was well aware of. Being mindful, it is very 70s and very musical forward. The scene then turns to an empty subway cart, 
shot very early in the morning to avoid crowds and, most importantly, police. Donovan and Payne begin a long game of cruising and teasing each other that would have made any young man in this day and age just go home and jerk off. But I digress. Payne then follows Donovan out of the subway and onto Christopher Street, where they walk all around Lower Manhattan. Donovan leads Payne into an adult toy store where Donovan tries on leather accessories and a pump. Payne then imagines Donovan standing over him and, well, I'll leave the rest to you watch the movie. After Payne wakes up from his daydream, he quickly exits to run after Donovan and they continue their courtship. The cruising continues into a theater where Payne buys a ticket and is greeted by a man who whips out his dick. Payne follows Donovan into the men's room, but seems a bit apprehensive and naive. Payne runs up the stairs and enters the theater when another man enters the stairwell looking for action. This time, it is Donovan who follows. And something I didn't consider the first time I watched the back row is Donovan and Payne are sitting down watching a movie within a movie. I wonder if this is a first. This is the first time I've come across it in a gay porn film. Both Donovan and Payne share a joint that today would seem perfectly fine, but was just as taboo as being in a gay porn theater in those days. Payne loosens up a bit, only to find Donovan has a friend sitting next to him now. Donovan persistently tried to get Payne, and only Payne's attention, but is met with ambivalence. Payne attempts to get more cruisy with Donovan, but they are interrupted by an onlooker. Donovan engages with both an onlooker and the flasher from earlier on in the film, while Payne stands outside of the bathroom upset at what he hears going on inside. When Donovan is done, he gets dressed and walks out of the bathroom to find a pissed off Payne who storms out. Donovan catches up to him and they make up. The back row has a very positive message after going through its own dark nights of the soul. But I like the idea that is presented that Donovan, while seemingly in love with Payne, who is a one-man kind of guy, is still enticed by a man who walks by and cruises Donovan while he's making out with Payne. The back row is filmed only a few years after Midnight Cowboy, a mainstream film with a big box office success and critical acclaim that originally received an X rating. The references in the back row to Midnight Cowboy are all too obvious. Nevertheless, the back row delivers a great narrative with no dialogue. The back row is a technically classy film mirrored with a suitable score. The back row was released and followed Wakefield Pool's Boys in the Sand into the 55th Street Playhouse, where the film enjoyed a longer run but did not enjoy the publicity of being a landmark film. Watching it today, a viewer can truly understand why the back row has earned its place in gay porn history. There was a remake made of the film in the early 2000s that was thankfully just an homage as opposed to a trend that caught on in gay porn films. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I'm your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, Discord. And if you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn where you can help support this channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers. Cheers.